Dear members of my archaeological family, um, I have to start with an apology. I, uh, when I thought of with my co-conspirators uh, this session, I sort of promised that I wanted to look outside, but as an emotional human being and, and being in a more introspective mood over the last three months, I sort of slid into, well, looking at us. Uh, so forgive me, I will not do what I've promised or set out to do. Um, I'm also a bit overwhelmed. All kinds of people have been kind enough of thanking me for the lecture last year, which may, makes me now almost as nervous as my first presentation at uni. And that's a very rare feeling for me. So um, you have uh, brought me in a new mindset, let's say. But without further ado, um, why things happen to bad people or good people? Well, mm -hmm. what they do to bad people, we know. But and to make things very simple, we are the good people. Uh, although we, uh, yeah, we are, I'm totally convinced. <laughs> there are a very limited amount of crooks in our body. And uh, we say nasty things about each other, but in the end, yeah, we are good people. Our aims are perhaps misguided, but they're not evil. Uh, so, uh, so let's go there. The end of the subtitle is, or how boxes help and hinder. A personal reflection. I could have said all kinds of titles, etc., but I'm speaking as member number 4731 of this institute. So, as me. Uh, I've talked before about the big line, but today I want to focus a bit more on a lot of small ones. And again, lies per se are not evil, but not bad. Therefore, well, sort of uh, saving your marriage in the sense of uh, do, do you forget the dishes? No, no, I was just thinking about it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> the highly experienced uh, archaeologists have, have all worked on goat schemes. That's not so interesting. This is one in the Netherlands. I want to take you along my experiences there. 2011, I spent most of the year there. Um, where it is doesn't really matter for the story. A very high expectation uh, which was disappointing. Hills. Yes, we have hills in the Netherlands. This was the hilly part. 4% of us. You think Lytics if you're there, and you think Roman, and Roman, and Roman. Uh, in the center of it all, uh, the uh, famous uh, uh, Thurman of uh, Heerlen, also known as Corder Vellum. But, and we were setting out there to do at least three villas. We were so convinced there should be three villas there. Uh, we went out and everyone was talking, oh, wonderful project, yeah, yeah, villa, villa, villa. Well, no villa there. This was probably the most profitable pr uh, project in Dutch archaeology ever. <laughs> um, I've done a test, I will not do it here. Over the last half year I talked to colleagues and friends and I said, uh, do you know I've run the uh, most profitable uh, project ever in Dutch archaeology? And you see them sort of switching off. <laughs> and that comes to me to the first conclusion, I would say, we are not commercial archaeologists. We cannot sell things. If I do this to bankers, and I tell them, I said, well, how did you do it? Tell me more. Archaeologists are, uh, did you find the filler? Uh, uh, our goals are totally different. <laughs> yeah. This was a complicated one. Our customer asked us to do a total environmental impact study in six months. Normally for this kind of thing, it's three years. You cannot do the purple things are the purple colors of authority. Uh, you cannot do much about that. So that's the question, that's the ask. Uh, and in the end, it turned out we knew there were eight competitors and we were one of them. We were the only ones bringing the bid in by thinking outside of the box. Everyone told us it couldn't be done. Well, we did. If you count the blocks, there is a bit more of the blocks, and some of the blocks are missing. Because in most cases, we go out there, and uh, especially when we do uh, things like orgrig and, and geophys, and we say, more research is needed. I can almost predict with a 95% <coughs> predictability that I, when I go out there with an auger, I come back and write a report and it says, more research is needed. So you cut that out and you do it all in one stage. That 
it saves time. And you sort of bitch it up, and you do more of the things which are critical. And you base it on a university studies about presence and that kind of thing. And even your customers tell you that it cannot be done. We did. First day, I had a secret agenda. This was uh, 10 years into uh, commercial archaeology in the Netherlands, and we were in the moan and groan stage. Well, well, we were always in the moan and groan stage. Um, but I had this idea, so I get this project, lots of money, I sort of redesigned, there's a source of social strategy underneath it, and we will start building bridges between ourselves. It will be lovely. This is the only time on the first day that all the teams were there and talking to each other about the archaeology. I even, I have to point it out, I even arranged something smart. I thought, I will not allow people to go off. No, we, we sort of create a community, so we hire some houses in a, a holiday park. Three East ones. Lovely placed. The staff there already called it before we entered, the first time I was there, and they said, oh, you're the people from the archaeology village. So we were something already there with, without having been there. We were quite privileged. We got our own parking space there on the edge. So, so we were treated like royalty, I would say. I was even a bit more smarter. I thought, well, there's all this evening, and we have to be there. So we will do the social structure thing. And you have the green company. You have the yellow company. And you have the blue company, which was my company. And a strange thing started to happen. I was totally convinced that we would meet and discuss. Nobody visited me. <laughs> I saw a movement when I looked out on the square between the yellow blocks. I saw movements between the green blocks. I saw never movement between the different colors. So I started to move. I was welcome everywhere. Hooray. But it's pretty difficult to say no to the boss, but so I was welcome. And one of the most un I was really sort of blown there. See the red star. I was there, there was a space between these houses of let's say two and a half meters, and there were two hedges. More than men I and I sort of came there on my rounds trying to get this whole social thing going. And then I stopped and I heard, discussing on my left, this problem of the project. And on my right, I heard the same discussion going on. And it was nice weather, there was no storm, there were no planes over it. I could hear them perfectly, and they could hear each other problem. And they were discussing about the same thing. Two and a half meters and two hedges. And <laughs> so, hooray. There was nothing there, we had a real problem. Commercially, not finding anything when everyone expects fillers is a problem. And we, we, should, we could have gone out, but... So we were all stunned with the same thing. As the, one of the staff said, there's not even uh, the hole to put the goat uh, on, so uh, uh, let's go on. It was lovely. Working in Limburg in summer, uh, the Burgundian lifestyle, uh, good eating, etc. Not... Well, if you find nothing, you don't have to work that hard, so it was nice, photogenic. <laughs> so I thought, let's, let's address one of these other problems. Every year when you meet at the national uh, conference, the Reuvesdagen, you have to think, do you remember these side visits we had when we uh, were at the state service? Yeah, and on the Friday we went over and... Uh, so I said, uh, well, we introduce uh, Pete, you get four hours to visit each other. On the, along the route. No reaction. A few days later, s s different members of the, the different teams come to me and they said that, Mark, if we uh, are allowed to uh, go uh, on these trips, can we just uh, have leave and go uh, off to uh, earlier to home? And I'm, I was thinking, what? You've been telling me for years how sad it is that we don't meet, and now you want to leave? This is the, these are the people who have fitch magnets who say, the best thing you can do is archaeology, well, with your pants on. And I want to leave early. <laughs> so I said no. And then, of course, they were angry. <laughs> <laughs> Last gambit. Last week, I thought, OK. We made, it was clear you were making quite a lot of money. So I went to my boss and said, I want to thank them. Let's have a party. So first reaction. 
Do we have to? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you have to. And we go out there and we have dinner. Lovely dinner. It's Limburg. They know how to serve well, uh, food well. And again, the people who talk during the day with each other were talking to each other. Then I had it. There was two hours of bowling afterwards. And people again were sort of congregating in the same groups they were working with, the same teams. And I thought, this is not going to happen. So I became the boss, authoritarian. And I said, you will play in this lane, this lane, this lane, this lane, this lane. Uh. <laughs> and then the bowling started. And strangely enough, people were talking about the bowling, but they were talking about the project. Suddenly they had the connection. Suddenly for two hours we were talking while bowling about this project, about our love of uh, the profession, of what it was to be an archaeologist. Suddenly there were cross connections. And I remember there, standing there, at, well, almost the end of the project, on the parking lot, and people in a constant swing coming, oh Mark, this is wonderful, we should have done this much more. These are the same people who six hours before and said, eh, then we have to. <laughs> That's us. I'm not slagging them because I probably at other occasions they do exactly the same. I'm not different, but I'm now at the stage and I'm lucky to be able to. But my whole experiment of sort of reinventing Dutch archaeology uh, was a bit of a failure, I have to admit. <laughs> Otherwise, we had promised to print 200 monographs in a more open way uh, to do this. This is not the monograph. In the end, it was decided, not by me, that 10 of these double binders, 1,200 pages, would be enough. Of these 1,200 pages, I'm proud of seven, the synthesis. <laughs> Again, something strange happened. I went into a, a small cabin, I wrote it in a day, the seven pages. I gave it to a colleague, and the colleague came back, Mark, it's wonderful. You probably could have said it in two pages, but it reads like poetry. I have reread it last week, and I think, well, it's not that good, but at least it's different. And the strange thing started to happen. You had to go off to lawyers and, and the customer, and at least 10 people had to look at it. And all of the, the, the digital ones came back with comments, except these seven pages. Seven pages where you sort of write out what you've done, your feeling, you use a bit of a poetic language, and suddenly nobody touches your text. What happened there? Strange thing is, I have two of them. In total, there are ten of them in the world, I have to say. Two of them are in open access. One, I have checked, is in the National Library, who has never been checked out. The other is in the uh, uh, village of uh, the city of Heerland itself, and is now inaccessible because they are restoring the whole bastion. And it has been seen by some member of the public for three times in the last six years. That's 2.7 million <laughs> euros. And I have two, so do the maths. That's 50% or 20% of that value is sitting underneath my desk. We were not welcome there. I don't have to translate it, but the project was highly unpopular. And we were the first there. I was even a, a sort of invited with the police to come and explain to the local uh, magistrate uh, what I was doing. So, uh, interesting stuff. But people were interested in the archaeology. In the end, again, one of these mad ideas, I decided to sort of get a meeting with all the landowners. And I would put my time in and, and the customer would rent us a room in the very nice uh, castle of Hoonsbroek. No, there was high doubts and oh, there will be protest. Oh, and, uh, oh, and if the press sort of finds out, oh, 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 problem, problem, problem. And I went there and I had nothing to tell because there were no fillers, so I only talked about the process. And the house was on fire, everyone liked it, and suddenly people were talking, and the amount of orange juice was, was uh, horrendous, but people were contacting, people who were totally expecting that nothing would happen in their community. A bit of other side. A few months ago I saw one of the first projects commercially I ever did was we sort of had this whole soul searching, how much square meters could we do on a, on a site? Well, we came up at 200. 
And we sort of, ooh, risky, risky, risky. I saw a project design, uh, or a bid, I have to say, uh, a uh, few months ago, for almost the same thing, for almost that kind of thing. We are 10 years down the road, and we have upped our productivity with a factor, factor of six, which is a tremendous result. And we should, in a sense, be proud of it. Problem is, our price has sort of, well, moved along on, let's say, inflation. So we work harder, we work more effective, we do more for, in essence, less money. <coughs> our businesses, our institutes, are marginal. I'm quoting economists. The amount of profit we make makes us marginal businesses. And marginal businesses are in the, well, let's say, the area where failure is possible, so we are living on the cliff edge. And we are aware of it. That's not a comfortable place to be. Uh, the state service, in an aside, uh, at some of the lectures, told us that, to their mind, the pricing level in the Netherlands should be twice as much as it is now. That's the state service telling us that they are worried about the economics of uh, the whole uh, yeah, project commercial archaeology. In essence, if you look at something what we do, if you have to compare us, we are acting as if we are hunter-gatherers. We have our track to the landscape, and it looks all very free and in nature, but it is a marginal existence. You have to be at these points during your track through the year, because there is the food source. You cannot stay at the lovely place where there is an abundance, because that will stop, and then if you wait too long, you must be at the other place. So you are constantly moving, you're constantly busy, and it puts pressure on us. We're never, in that sense, sure. We are still not archaeological farmers. We're still hunter-gatherers, in my mind. And we have a box. Everyone has a box. And that's not a problem in itself, but is the box the right box? The box has four walls, and most of them are legal, technology, physical, moral. You can sort of fill around with them. Technology. Technology is there. We could do all kinds of wonderful things with technology. And for instance, uh, on the right, the most interesting thing is uh, uh, the schaafbak, which is also an explanation uh, uh, why we have this higher productivity in the last years. Uh, it's not that costly. Uh, the amount of trouble it, it took us to get this on board and accept it uh, by all kinds of people is amazing. It is the tool to, especially on clay and sand, to well, make your life easier be better for your back, uh, helps you to uh, clean uh, surfaces. <coughs> sorting, I put some Lego there, but there are very nifty ways of sorting and fitting uh, all kinds of materials to each other. There are probably all kinds of interesting firms in, uh, in the UK or in, in Silicon Valley who would give us money to well, play around with the archaeology uh, to well, make their tool work. We still are thinking that the best way to sort things and fix things is by hand. The law. We have the impression that the law is unchangeable. But everyone knows that there was a different law before Maggie Thatcher did things to us. And I can predict, I cannot say when, that the laws of the land will change. I can even predict that the laws which seem so, this is a trick by lawyers by the way, you put all these books there and you're very steady and calm and, and authoritative. But Laws is, are a very flexible thing, if you're willing to, well, knock on the walls and, well, it's the same with regulations. We constantly say, it cannot be done, why? Because of the standards. Oh, many a case you can do things differently. Physically, we are so used to dig from the top to the down. But why not, in some cases, use the cut, the profile? I am especially myth with me that I have lost the publication of a Polish scientist, a, a mathematician, and uh, written in 1937, I took the trouble, it's highly mathematical, and he has proven that any way you attack the archaeological resource gives you the same amount of data and money. So why are, are we always digging in that way? Because we're used to it. There are circumstances that the cut is stronger than the planum, so why not use that, why not change our techniques? 
If you don't get your head around it, I will talk you to and drive you mad by these kind of things. We could even turn these things around. Then we can really dig it chronologically. Ethics. Ethics, as I was taught, is a, a running constant discussion between professionals or, or scientists. Ethics in archaeology, in most cases in a commercial thing, is it cannot be done. Why? Because it's unethical. That's the end of the discussion. That's how far we engage with, with ethics. We think we live in a big box. The truth is that we're probably living in a very small box. Why? Because we are these marginal people who are in fear of our existence, our continual thing. It is not bad that you stay in the box. But it, perhaps it's very unhealthy to stay in the box. The dysfunctional family. Yes, of course, you ask, think now that they will be clicking on and, and all these people around. You can fill them in how you like. You can do company A, B, C, D. You can do university department A, B, C, D. You can do uh, curators, uh, consultants, uh, companies, universities. Put them in. Put four parties in. And we will all be slagging each other off. There is an idea almost in, in, in the Amazon that you have this idea of small tribes and when you ask them what are humans, humans are the people around you, literally around you, in your small circle. Humans are not the others. Well, we are a bit more sophisticated, but the time of the amazing time, and I've did it done as well, where we say, oh, they don't get it. Oh, it's always them. It's always us. It's always conflictuous. And if we're here, well, things are all right. And it's highly uh, unhelpful to, uh, to talk in that way. Again, it is very understandable. If you're in a risk-taking environment, you have to strengthen the group. You have to, uh, you have to be close to your group. You have to work with that group. So you have to put more pressure on the group identity. There are other groups. Metal detectorist. <laughs> I will read the 10 truths between detectorist and archaeologist. This is in The Guardian, December. Very well worded piece why we archaeologists are not that happy with a uh, uh, met metal detectorist. Some of us even get an allergic reaction even at this day uh, when you talk about metal detectorist. <coughs> the metal detectorists are back. They don't like to uh, be excluded. So. On their initiative, there is a sort of a portable antiquity scheme in the Netherlands. They have outmaneuvered us. Nowadays, by the new law, it is perfectly permitted to do what they are, what they do. We have always said no, they have said yes. Power and force, our influence. This is a statement of the head of research of the RCA, the state service. I have to tell you that the universities have no influence with the minister. The companies have a very limited amount of influence with them, and the minister listens to the amateur archaeologist. So, there we are, being experts. The fall and rise of the amateur. When the new laws came in, that sort of flat, how to put it diplomatically? Professional archaeologists kicked the amateurs in the nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and strangely enough, they didn't like it. And they have made a plan. And they came back with a vengeance. They spent a lot of time, discussion, expertise, to get where they are now, the most influential voice in Dutch archaeology. They have the ear of the minister. So what did we earn in the end? By saying, oh, it must be professional. The arts are coming for us. Perhaps you've seen this. Uh, this is uh, the Biennale of uh, 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 last December. Damien Hurst. Damien Hurst. Damien Hurst got 25 million euros to have a project to fake archaeology. <laughs> there is even a, a documentary on it with the comment, this cy cinematic journey into the waters of East Africa chronicles the story behind the artist Damien Hurst's massive exhibition of oceanic treasures. They've changed it. First it was a sort of a guise as a, a, a literally a documentary. It is pretty well done. It's total nonsense, but it's pretty well done. 
25 million as an art impression. Artists in my surrounding tell me, you have to see this, you have to see this. They like this. It's total fake. And it's also kitsch. But then, that's the art part of things. This is the big success film. Yes, it's not archaeology. No. There she is, Tomb Raider. It makes more money than, than, uh, than well, let's say, half of European commercial archaeology. There is this young group of people of us, and I'm a avowed gamer who have something going on which is archaeo gaming. And the rest of us, most of us say, well, that's nothing. Uh, it's not real archaeology. The power of gamers at this stage on, in Western society is amazing. These gamers are rich people who give money what they like, and they like in an abbreviated form archaeology. It's perhaps not our archaeology, but they like it. Are we dense? Are we bad people? Are we stupid? Absolutely not. And we need routine. One of the most traumatic experiences in my life when my mom forced me to learn to tie my, t my uh, shoelaces. It was horrendous. <laughs> Nowadays, I can do it without seeing it. I've learned it. We do quite a lot of routine. We need to. Thinking is a hard process. So every time, if you had, every time I had to do two foot laces, and I had to spend these three hours sitting and crying on a stool, that things would be quite difficult. <laughs> There's another solution, it's called Velcro. <laughs> <laughs> there, you can also think about driving a car. Do you remember when you had your first driving lessons and you did hardly anything? You were dead tired, you couldn't do a thing. Nowadays you sort of realize, oh, I'm 50 miles down the road. Your brain is... We need these boxes, we need to work, but we need to realize that they work. We have, by open things up, we put the box on the side and said, oh, look inside. And then we even talk about the future. We lengthen the box, and uh, nowadays we have a nice tunnel, but we don't see the end. In essence, we're still in the box, but then, yeah, we have an essence of speed, we have an idea of, but we don't have a connection with the rest of us. It is something, I, I was looking for something which other groups who've gone through it. And I suddenly realized that fish, fish is a food which makes people passionate. There's much more passion about fish and, or even loathing about fish. But, and I was thinking communities on the Dutch uh, North Sea coast, fishing villages, marginal, uh, very knowledgeable, uh, doing exciting stuff, dangerous stuff. Uh, and they uh, suddenly the arts come in. There's this whole tradition of, of uh, painting fishing ships, painting uh, beachfronts with fishing, a fisherwoman, all kinds of things. This is a mesdag. Uh, well, there's this connection. There is almost no group in Dutch society in the 19th century which uh, tickles the whole thing of the high culture of the painters. And these are very normal and very poor people. Uh, you even see it in low culture. All these groups sort of say different. Uh, we could say this is firm A, firm B, firm C. We all try to differ each other by these kind of things. And they're all very acrimonious to each other. If you're living in one of these villages or village and you want to do, uh, marry a boy or a girl from another village, life is very difficult for you. Crossing boundaries and is also very difficult. It is also highly dangerous. The sea, give it, the sea, take it away. Literally, people die. Well, perhaps not in archaeology, but uh, there are a lot of people with burnouts, with problems which sadly leave, uh, which well, feel lessened by the experience. These are also people, the rescuers are there. And the heroes of the 18th century, or the 19th centuries, are, there are many papers of people in rowboats rescuing a lot of people. Interesting stuff. The game changer for these very poor families with a high mortality living on the edge on a marginal existence was a play. In 1900, the play comes Op Hoop van Zeven. Suddenly there is a game changer. You should, it is, it is a horrendous play. It is full of sentimentality and uh, typical 19th century. But it reached, suddenly, a totally different goal. Suddenly people were saying, it's scandalous. People had been saying for years it was scandalous that uh, uh, how fishermen were treated, and oh, it was so bad. And probably the fishermen said it themselves. 
And suddenly there was someone else, someone from the arts who said, well, look at it differently, a play. This is a classic example in the whole socialist tradition of, uh, well, making life better <coughs> by doing something totally out of the box. There is still this chance, and we still dream, and I hope to continue, of heaven, Arcadia. And it would encourage us to do. What we should do is mending fences. We should be more welcoming. We will have, as Tim has said, with a warm heart and a cool head, so let's say that's emotion. <coughs> Create social capital. Uh, respect your box. There's nothing wrong with our box. There's a very good reason why we're in the box. But remember, it's only a box. It is just a construct in the here and now. Enhance the sense of well-being of yourselves and others. That's helpful. We may feel good about what we're doing. And I'm coming back to a sentence which has haunted me, the archaeology of happiness. Why not? Why not aim to be happy, to be joyful? One of the best experiences I had with an amateur archaeologist was with an ar amateur archaeologist who built copies of Neolithic pots. It was something weird. He didn't believe they would stay up. So therefore, he used chicken wire. Very nice conversations. Very nice to meet him. It was total nonsense, but the enjoyment of it all and the meeting was great. So why hack it? Why be, oh, this is not archaeology. Why not? He enjoyed it, and the pot looked great. <laughs> a proposal, as a member, I would do to the board, and, 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 and uh, there has been a sort of thing, think tank. Do have people there who are willing to engage, be one of these volunteers of the 225 who think about the future, who think about, let's call it the madness and the glory of, of, of enjoying archaeology. Let's, and always put it in front, do always 25 years further. So I would, let's say, and to quote other popular culture, don't hack it, join it, back to the future. Let's start to go on the road to, well, a more entertaining, funny, nice, emotionally more rewarding archaeology. So, to our shared future archaeology. Mm -hmm.